Buju Anin, Rita Walzek Arnt Indijnakaz, Gawaba Baganakug Indunjaba. Hello, everyone. My name is Rita Walzek Arnt, and I am of Polish descent and a citizen of the White Earth Nation of Ojibwe. My role at MNHS is a collections outreach specialist in the Native American Initiatives Department. Welcome to the Minnesota Historical Society and to the eighth event in the Artists in the Gallery series. To start us off, I would like to say that my colleagues and I here at MNHS acknowledge that Minnesota is Dakota and Ojibwe homeland. Dakota creation stories are centered in Minnesota, and this regional territory is also an important place in traditional Ojibwe history, as well as those of other tribal nations. Today, Minnesota is both ancestral and contemporary home to many native people, including 11 Dakota and Ojibwe tribal nations. We're coming to you from our home today, but we want to connect you with our, our home exhibit space and the be beautiful artworks and stories that we have shared within the space. The museum is now open and we welcome you to visit by reserving tickets online. The idea of home and homelands plays a central role in our recently developed exhibit, Our Home, Native Minnesota. This program will be archived and available as a recording on Facebook and YouTube. The Artists in the Gallery series highlights many of the artists featured in the Our Home Native Minnesota exhibit. Support for this program pr is provided by the Rosemary and David Good Family Foundation. We invite you to fill out a short survey following today's program and let us know what you think. Your input helps us build better programs. I have had the pleasure of working with many artists, Native artists over the years, and I'm thrilled to be part of today's Artists in the Gallery series with my Nijikwe, Maggie. Maggie, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, Buju, Maggie Thompson, Indigenous Cause. Hello, my name is Maggie Thompson. I am Fond du Lac Ojibwe, um, but was born and raised here in the Twin Cities. I hold a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Textiles from the Rhode Island School of Design and graduated in 2013. Since moving home, um, I started a business called Makwa Studio, where I encompass both my fine arts practice and my uh, knitwear design. And in addition to that, I also do curatorial work and then also some teaching um, primarily with youth. And then I'm a board at the Te Minnesota Textile Center. Um, I am really thankful to be here today. I want to thank all of you for showing up um, and also to Rita for asking me to be a part of this program. The History Center has been a huge um, support of my work since moving back home from school. Um, so yeah, I'm just, I'm excited to be here and to dive in. Great, thank you, Mary, Ma Mary, Maggie. Um, so we're gonna have a conversation, but we will have a question and answer portion of this program towards the end. Please feel free to leave your questions in the comments. We have staff moderating that space there later. So Maggie, let's start at the beginning. <laughs> Back when you were little, Maggie. So tell us, what do you create? And how and when did you begin creating? Yeah, so I guess, I mean, right now my main focus is in textiles, but my um, I've been doing art ever since I was a kid. My mom is a painter and was, is a photographer, and my dad was a graphic designer and musician. So I was really um, surrounded by arts a lot as a kid. Um, my mom has also had a studio at the Northrop King Building since I was in about third or fourth grade. Um, in the Northeast Arts District. And um, I also went to uh, Waldorf school when I was younger, starting in fourth grade. So there it's an alternative learning space. So they're really rooted in um, like arts and like integrating arts into all disciplines throughout like K through, they even have like 12th, up to 12th grade. Um, so they really focus on um, experiential learning. So I feel like that has had a major impact, especially because that's where I first learned how to knit. Um, and then I also um, went, yeah, so I guess it, I was just kind of raised with it. It was a part of my life um, all, always. And so I went to a couple different high schools, but ultimately ended up at Purpose Center for Arts, which um, really taught me a lot about what it, like, you had to interview to get in and put together a portfolio. And then um, while I was there, we learned about um, many different mediums. So like painting, drawing, screen printing, mono printing, 
photography, you know, you had to learn how to document your own work, um, put together a portfolio and artist statement. And then we would also have critiques. Um, and so that was really important in my journey, which then ultimately introduced me to the pre-college program at Rhode Island School of Design. And um, so I was able to get assistance putting together an application um, and applied to that and then was allowed to participate in their summer program in architecture originally, um, which is also another passion of mine um, and is what I originally went to school for at RISD, but then transferred into the textiles department. Um, so it's art has, yeah, it's just, it's been present ever since I was born. I think my mom gave me my first sketchbook when I was like two or something, so. That's great. And it's so wonderful that you've had the opportunities to be part of different art schools over your life, not just in college. Mm -hmm. But let's talk about um, post-secondary for a second. Um, what, how did school develop, help you develop yourself as an artist? Yeah, well, um, I mean, at RISD, there's a foundational year. So I feel like um, before you even enter your major, you like learn about um, drawing and three-dimensional and 2D art. And I feel like during that, um, you really start to train your eye and they like test you on your critical thinking and like push boundaries in terms of like what you use for like tools and like problems. So, like we, I remember we had to um, do a bridge project made out of straws and it had to like hold a can of coke and all you could use was like string and pins and if you couldn't get that straw bridge to hold your can of coke you had to you failed and you had to do it again um so they really pushed you to think critically and problem solve um and then also just hard work i feel like RISD really ingrained a good work ethic in all of it, its students and it's something we, we still joke and talk about today um, everyone seems, um, it, you know, they're really driven, I feel like. And um, also, it was a very technical school. So you learn a lot of um, skills in terms of like weaving techniques, um, knitting techniques, like whatever your major is, it's very technical based. And then also, in terms of developing me as an artist, one thing in the textile program that we did was create like inspiration boards. So you come up with like concepts or ideas. So it's like taking visual information and internalizing it and then putting it out as something new or different. So, um, you know, like you pick a topic, if you like butterflies or something and, you know, you, you create all this visual material about butterflies and think about texture, color, um, you know, material and all that stuff. So they, and material was a big thing too in my education is Rizzi really pushed its students to, at least in the textile department, to explore materials and work on integrating like materials and techniques and see what works and doesn't. Um, so it was all about like exploration. And then also of course, critique was a huge part of school. Um, you know, like we'd get an assignment at the end of the day, and but spend the most of the day critiquing, or yeah, get an assignment at the end of the day. Next week, spend most of the day like critiquing what you made. Um, so you you learn how to take feedback and criticism, um, and you can take what you want and leave what you want. And I think that was really important. Um, and yeah, I feel like that. But yeah, that, that's that. <laughs> No, that's great. And that's a lot of important things to learn from school, especially like in your field. And I think the critiquing thing is actually really great because I think it helped you navigate the art world. In a, like you had experience, you weren't necessarily brokenhearted right away when somebody made a critique because you had that experience. So let's start talking about your experience with, I like to call it the scene, but... <laughs> In the Minnesota art world, when you came back here, what was your experience? Yeah, so I um, I really like being an artist in Minnesota. I feel like it's a really supportive place, um, and especially having a Native community here. Um, I first, um, when I moved back, my first show was at All My Relations Gallery, 
um, and I received a lot of support with them. And Minnesota also has really great funding. And I feel like everyone's in the arts district. There's just so much in Northeast Minneapolis. I feel like South Minneapolis, like St. Paul, art is just kind of everywhere. Um, and yeah, and then, yeah, I feel like <laughs> about to go into another question. Um, there's just a, it's, it's a great community. Um, and I have no regrets moving back. Great. So um, what resources, you're talking about how Minnesota is a great art scene. What kind of resources have you found um, that is valuable to you as an artist in this, the Minnesota Twin Cities art world? Yeah, so I, um, I feel like resources, well, definitely the History Center. I feel like they... I mean, the Museum Fellowship Program was um, the very first thing I applied to after getting out of school, um, which, um, you know, talking about um, collections and learning about the different tribes in Minnesota um, and just the whole museum world, that was kind of the first time I spent a lot of more intimate time in a museum setting before I kind of just, I mean, I'd go to them, but I didn't quite enjoy or understand them. So I feel like it was really helpful. And then um, in that sense, and then also um, I worked at um, Two Rivers Gallery at the Minneapolis American Indian Center, um, which also helped um, me network with other museums and art spaces through that work, which also then trickled into my work as an artist as well. So just like networking um, and then also just funding. I feel like there's been a really great, or yes, funding. So like I have applied um, or received some grants with the help and assistance of like the textile center to create a body of work. So then that, you know, it helped purchase supplies and then also gave me an exhibition opportunity. Wonderful. So speaking about your work, I wanna talk about where you have had your work displayed and talk about some of your pieces and we have some images to go to so you'll just have to be descriptive and then our our tech team will be helpful and then we can talk about the pieces a bit okay yeah so i mean like i said my first exhibit was at all my relations gallery and then so there i had um my i showed a lot of work from my senior year of school which included my family portrait piece which we have a picture of um, and so this is talking about identity and blood quantum. So I have my self in the middle and then my mom on the right and then my dad on the left um, talking about why I identify as being native, um, looking at my blood quantum, um, breaking it down really easily into a visual form um, for such a complex subject. Um, and so this was also uh, acquired by the Minneapolis Institute of Art. So it's currently hanging there, I think. Um, and so I've had, yeah, so that opportunity came out of showing at All My Relations, um, which is really great. And then I've also, like I said, worked with the Textile Center. So there I did um, a piece called, what is it called? fragments <laughs> and it's a bed piece. So I really like to kind of push the boundaries of what textiles are. So this piece is a photo of a sunset and then it's cut into triangles and sewn on the back of um, kind of like a sheet and made into this fragmented jagged quilt blanket. And I like to put a lot of stories um, with my work. So this one is specific to um, my dad and this whole exhibit was about um, losing my dad to pancreatic cancer and just processing those emotions and everything that comes with dealing with death. Um, so this piece is a sunset and he would call me when I was in school and tell me to look at the sunset. So it was like our way of connection and then sleeping because I would have a lot of anxiety at night about um, forgetting memories and I think you know, like you, you're losing a person and you don't want to lose those memories. And then um, 
Yeah, so that's that's that piece. And so that was at the Textile Center and that's been in a couple different exhibits. Um, what's the museum in Duluth? There's a museum in Duluth and then the- The Tweed? Yes, thank you. Yep. And then um, I've also did uh, an installation piece. I call it an a live installation um, at the Walker. Um, and it, that was a series of- And that's with the twins? Yes, with the twins. Um, so this was the first time I've done more, I guess, well, the bed piece was three-dimensional, but um, just live, per, or like, per, I mean, it wasn't really performance, but had real humans. I also had another human. Anyways, this is the first time that I had like people um, more, what am I trying to say? Anyways, there is, I'm just going to start over. So this piece had three different installations, uh, one with the twins. There were um, two other friends of mine um, talking together um, and like reading out of different books. And then my friend Dawi, who um, works on tools and like weapons. So he was working on a bow, but it's all about um, the expectation of native artists to create work about identity although here i am creating work about identity but so the twins are here um they're like my nieces so these are all familiar people to me um and then they have an easily identifiable um something as being native so the the shawls and then um they're on a pedestal and they're chained to the pedestal because i feel like the entrapment of your identity like you can't get away from it um, and there's that expectation and then but they're just watching a movie so it's like you know like you have this visually like i'm not explaining this well anyway so like contemporary but also like stuck within these identities what movie were they watching they were watching it was oh man the one with the kid from new zealand oh it's a oh funny. yeah i know with, yes, Taika made it. Taika Waititi. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that I can't remember. I know what it is. It's the Wilder People, the Hunt for the Wilder People. Yes, Hunt for the Good Wilder People. Good film. Yeah. Um, so how for that piece, since there was people involved, how do you feel like that was um how did the audience respond to that differently than just, you know, like just your static work? Did you see any difference or how? You feel that how that went? Um, I think it was def. I mean, I feel like people. Well, they responded differently to the different groups. I feel like the two adult women, like people, kind of avoided more the kids. They were like, kind of. I mean, they were interested, but kind of scared to talk to. And then they talked to Dawi. Like Dawi got the most conversation. And then I mean, uncomfortability too. Um, yeah, I feel like I'm still kind of <laughs> processing that piece, but it's, um, I think visually the twins piece was the most successful one just cause it's kids and it's, you know, like really, yeah. yeah. Great. And I think we have another piece to highlight. Yeah. So then there is Swallow. So this piece is, um, it is, it showed at a gallery space and I'm forgetting the name of it in the Twin Cities, but this I created during a residency at the Institute of American Indian Arts. Um, and there I was set up in their 3D lab because I like to ex explore with like different mediums. So I, I, there are laser cut pieces in here. It is essentially a quilt um, sewn together with a photo transfer of the interior of an esophagus. And so, and then there, each little square is a pocket. So within those pockets, there are these laser cut um, clear modules um, that kind of, they're just like randomly shaped, but they're supposed to um, be like cancer cells. So when you shine a light on them, which this photo doesn't do justice, but on the edge, you kind of get like this more out like an outline of the shape um so that was talking about esophageal cancer 
and just the disco discovery of um, cancer and something growing secretly inside your body. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. I don't think I've ever seen that piece. So it's really great to hear about that and think about all of the thought that you put into it and the work and like all, all parts of you, not just, you know, just making the piece itself, but using like your emotional energy, your mental energy. I think that's wonderful. Um, I just want to take a break now to tell everybody to please put questions in the chat because in, a, in about 20 some minutes, we'll take some questions and Maggie loves to answer questions. So, and then make them hard so we can get her thinking too. Um, so let's talk about business. So your business is called Mukwa Studio and tell us more about that. Yeah, so Makwa Studio, Makwa means bear in Ojibwe. Um, it's, I started it in 2014, um, but I really needed something that was flexible and I wanted to create work for myself and not design for another company. Um, so, and then after doing fine art work, I also wanted to create work that was more accessible to people and I really, um, like the idea of having it be functional. So knitwear was like a good fit um, in terms of textile work. And then, um, yeah, so I, for Makwa, at least for the knitwear portion, I mostly do hats and cowls. Um, and then I'm hoping to do other things, but it also encompasses my fine arts practice and community work and teaching and everything. And I, I guess I'm, interested in like how my work joins the conversation of what contemporary native art and fashion is because I feel like I take subtle cultural references but not necessarily it's not necessarily blatantly like native or whatever I mean, I mean just I, so it's those are the conversations that I like to engage in with that work as well and then I um Let's see, I knit on a uh, brother flatbed knitting machine. So it's 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 faster than hand knitting, but it's um, still hand driven. So it is very physical. Um, I do all my own punch cards, so pattern designs. And then um, I know there's a link um, for Minnesota Original um, that you guys can check out what the machine looks like and how it works. And then, um, yeah, and then it's, so I create, do all the knitting, and then it's like all hand piecing together. And then, um, yeah, what else about my, so my studio is in the Northrop King building, um, which I really love because um, of the artist community. And I have, um, I think, three knitting machines now and a couple looms. And, um yeah, I, as a business, I, I feel like I jump from one thing to another. So I'll like focus a lot on fine artwork. And then during the winter season, it's like all knitwear. And then um, I try to be flexible though too. So that, yeah. No, that's great. And now that we've run through like your schooling and your fine art and your business, I wanted to talk a little bit of like what it's like to work in like a gallery space or a museum space as an artist. Like, so we can talk about your time at Two Rivers and like how you collaborate with community and whatnot. Yeah, so I feel like, yeah, I mean, I really enjoy it. I, you know, it's, I feel like you kind of understand. <laughs> the process of an artist. So it's the patience and um, working at Two Rivers Gallery, we worked a lot with like emerging artists. So, and I really enjoy teaching. So that was something I would always try and have folks do is come in and help paint the exhibit if they could, or like teach other community members how to do it too. Um, and then we also did a lot of workshops. And I, I think that was my favorite part was like working in community in those workshops. Um, and so we, we did like a quiller class. Um, we did a drum making class. Like first gift would come work in the, so anytime there's a lot of people in activity, um, that was, that meant the most to me. And then um, 
let's see. And then also the Moz exhibit through MNHS and like mentoring the kids and teaching them and really I feel like they just they're just so smart. <laughs> and like think, you know, like hearing about how the youth are thinking about and processing the world and their identities. Um is was also yeah, probably my favorite exhibit of the year. Yeah, I just wanted to mention um, MNHS used to um, sponsor a teen, American Indian team photography program called Mazanat Kazige. And we were lucky to partner with Maggie when she was working at Two Rivers Gallery at the Indian Center to be able to have a gallery space for the work so that the students could put their work on display for a show. And it was always really fun and wonderful to see because of how it was likely their first time um, showcasing their work and to be able to do it, to talk about it, to say what their feelings and meanings are, I think is really grateful and wonderful. So uh, I just wanted to mention that. Oh, and then I'll move on. Okay, so I don't know if you know, but there's this, this something that happened and it's called COVID-19. And we've been in this pandemic or whatever other people call it, like the panda bears or whatever. It's just funny. People are fu people say funny things, okay? I'm trying to be funny, okay? Um, but anyway, so COVID hit. And I know you had a little bit of struggle as real things when it at the beginning of COVID. And so tell us what you did. <laughs> yeah, so this entire year has been a trip for everyone. Um, but I... Yeah, at the beginning of the pandemic, I was uh, furloughed from my job, um, which was a shock to me and like really threw me in gear. I was like, I can either sit around or I can get to work. Um, so I ended up moving my entire studio practice home um, to work from home just to stay isolated and um, quickly started making face masks once I heard folks out east um, talk about the shortage of PPE. So I was able to gather um, like a lot of excess materials from my studio um, and start sewing masks. Um, for first of all, or first I started sewing them for folks in like hospitals and clinics and stuff. And then I had a lot of inquiries from friends and community members asking for masks. Um, so out of that actually can i sorry to stop you i just realized there's a lovely story about one of the first ribbon masks you made for somebody asked you to make one for their mother yes yes so this um it was, it was a mask that was made so one woman reached out and asked um for me sorry my roommate is walking asked me to um make a mask for her mom who was receiving chemo. So I um, sorted through all my scraps and I found, I think it was a dishcloth that belonged to my mom and it had this beautiful like floral embroidery on it. Um, so I cut that out and positioned it on the mask um, for her um, to give to her mom. So it was like, had more meaning and um, was more design, I guess. And then, um, yeah, so then after that, that kind of, you know, I wanted to make masks that had more meaning or design or intention behind it. And that's kind of where I started um, making the ribbon masks, um, which was the first one was also for a friend, a close friend who was going through chemo as well. And so um, I, <laughs> and also wanted to keep making donate and donating masks. So by making this mask, I thought I could sell this one and then donate two to community members and hospitals and other clinics. And so I started selling these ones online. Rita's putting one on right now um, to help with that initiative. And also knowing that I was currently out of a job and you know had still had studio rent. So it really saved my practice, um, being able to be flexible and shift from knitting to mask making. Yeah, and then also you can talk about, so the ribbons, I like the idea is, um, you know, it, like when I see ribbons, I recognize it as coming from, you know, like like earrings, like Rita's wearing her earrings. I'm like, oh, she's gotta be native or know a native or support native, you know, so it's um, all about um, 
creating that connection between two people. So I feel like it's easily identifiable. Um, so in a time of isolation, if two people are wearing ribbing masks and they see each other from across the street, they'd be able to have that sense of connection. Um, yeah. What? <laughs> so masks, you're making masks. It's in the yeah. middle of a pandemic. Uh, Memorial Day comes along and stuff happens. Unfortunately, the, comes the murder of George Floyd. Yep. So then doing what you do is you use your amazing skills and tell us what you use your amazing skills for. Yeah, so during the, after the death of George Floyd um, and all the protests were happening, my friend, um, Dear friend Jada Gray Eagle, who is an amazing photojournalist and beadwork artist, and she has, anyway, so many talents. Um, but we started uh, producing um, uh, face masks for protesters that said, I can't breathe on them with the help of, um, oh my goodness, Carbon Copy Co. I'm forgetting her name off the top of my head. Carrie, I think, and then, uh, a bunch of other artists like quickly jumped in. Um, Tyler Hawkinson, he's a tattoo artist. So they were screen printing. And um, I think people gathered really quickly to, to jump in and help. And so um, we were going out um, almost daily, dropping off these masks to protesters. And we were trying to get them to folks who were unmasked and then also to BIPOC folks. Um, and the yeah the idea was to you know like like standing together uniting folks with the same message and then also protection and um yeah i mean that was i think we had about maybe 30 or 40 sewers at home working overnight so we'd give them um kits of 20 to sew overnight and drop off the next day and i think we like made over well over 5,000, maybe six or 7,000 masks that we've handed out. Um, so yeah, mobilizing community. And then um, I think it was also a way for folks to contribute who didn't necessarily feel comfortable um, going out to the protest, but wanted to support as well. Great. That's so wonderful to see and then how easily you adapted, even though you don't, you probably don't think how easily you adapted, but you did. And it's been wonderful. And it's so great to see the journey. Um, I want to ask about um, collaboration when it comes to collaboration. Who have you been collaborating with? Businesses, artists, other things. Let's talk about that. What are the kind of favorite things that you've been doing? Yeah. Um, so, well, I do sell my work through Beyond Buckskin alongside my website. So Jessica has been a huge support of um, my knitwear practice since the very beginning. Um, She's, yeah, I started selling through her website um, early on. And then also um, this past summer, um, Tamara Oppelmitt put on a, a, an event through the American Craft Council um called craft labs so originally we were going to do uh, more teaching with community but because of the pandemic it ended up just being myself um april smith who works on black ash baskets and then pat cruz who does birch bark work and so we did kind of like a skill share um where like we spent three days together so each day a different one of us would teach the other two how to do their art form. And then um, out of that, we were then um, asked to create a piece kind of combining the techniques. And I think there's a, a photo sample of that um, that can be showed. So I did, um, it's just a small sample, but it's the hex weave um, with old, some kind of like film tape or something that I got at Axeman because I love exploring with different materials and then just cut colored paper um, sewn on the same way that Pat taught us how to do the floral patterns um, on the hats that he taught us how to make, which I think we also, um, yep. So that was really fun. Um, I've 
loved Pat's work ever since I've moved home. So it, it meant a lot to be able to learn from him and to learn how to make this hat. Cause I, I first saw it at the history center too, one of his hats. And then April Smith, um, it was my first time meeting her and learning about her um, artwork too. And then, um, yeah, so that meant a lot during pandemic um, to be able to, and they're older too. So I feel like, and they, they come from, you know, like they know a lot about tra their traditional arts. And I feel like that, that meant a lot. Cause I, I come from more of like my, I don't know a lot about art, the traditional arts. I don't know what else to say. So I, I like have more of a contemporary perspective, I think. Um, so just learning that the tradition was, um, yeah, really important. And then, um, what other collaborations we did the so I was approached by Asco Finlayson, which is a company located <laughs> Rita, um, a company located here in Minneapolis. And um, I've also admired their storefront and what they do for a really long time, but they're really focused on um, environmental issues. And so they asked me to design for them their North hats. So I thought this would be a really good opportunity um, to bring in language. Um, so um, Kiwaden means North in Ojibwe. So with that, you know, I kind of wanted to use um, this hat as a tool for education. So in like highlighting the language, um, Ojibwe language. Um, so as I learn, I hope that anyone who buys this hat will now never forget the word North in Ojibwe. And then also um, at, <laughs> by working, I also worked with Rita um, during an internship and I fell in love with the otter track pattern. So that had a lot of significance for me. So I wanted to use that as the bands around the, the North hat for that um, and tell that story and have folks recognize that symbol. And for folks who don't know, the otter track design is an Ojibwe motif that's been on bandolier bags such as this one, but all, it's what the tracks of the otter are in the winter time. So apparently they walk and then they go on their bellies and then they walk some more. So that's where they get that track from. And it's super neat and super cool. I suggest Googling it to see videos because it's awesome. But it's a great way to continue incorporating um, Ojibwe designs into other things. And I mean, it's very appropriate, north, winter. I just think it fits. Yep. All right. So just in a, a few minutes, we're going to take questions. So I only have a, one thing left to talk to me about, and that is, what does the future hold for you and your art life? and other life, maybe your personal life. That's good. <laughs> yeah. So right now I am, well, working on finishing up ribbon masks and using the material that I had for that. But I'm um, working on <laughs> saving and will soon be fundraising for an industrial knitting machine, um, which we do have a picture of. So this is... God, I don't know how big it is, maybe 12 feet by like seven or eight feet. It's really big. It's massive. It's expensive. Um, it's incredible. And this um, technology, I learned how to use, or we started programming in school, but the year or the fall before the pandemic hit, I went to uh, Reutling in Germany to Stoll headquarters and took um, classes directly from them on how to we did a lot of like pattern analysis and um like analyze structures and so if if you hand me a knit piece i can identify it and recreate it essentially so they like really drilled that um into its their students and then also took a, a like handling maintenance and operation class on how to use that machine and then a programming class so they have a uh, um, M1 plus program, computer program. So all the knitwear is done through computer programming and then knit up automatically on that machine. 
So with that machine, um, it'll alleviate a lot of time for me and I'll be able to produce more. Um, you can do more difficult um, patterns and structures on it um, and just reduce the, the time by like a lot. And um, I, with that machine, I, I also hope to work with other artists. So it's, I want to use it for knitwear, but I also really want to make it accessible to other artists for if they want to do knitwear or fine art or like, you know, I keep it really open-ended um, and kind of educate others about it. And then, um, and then also thinking about native fashion and advancing it with technology. And I um, am really interested in like smart textiles and medical textiles or materials and learning more about that too. So that's, that's my main focus for this year because I was originally going to do it last year, but um, I'm going to put all I have into it and hopefully get it. Yeah. Is there anything, any type of clothing item that you want to make next? Besides uh, hat and scarves? What about gloves? I mean, honestly, <laughs> sweaters. <laughs> No, I mean, there's a lot of stuff. I mean, I, I really want to, yes, yeah, start making sweaters and like knit pants or like jumpsuits or like interiors or I don't know, interior stuff, pillowcases, um, but really focus on structure and technique um, instead of having it be so flat. So creating more three dimensional work. Do you think you'll do more mixed media pieces? I know you would, you have incorporated some beadwork with in general or with the yeah in general oh yeah definitely um i have that's another thing i have a couple shows coming up um that i'm working on pieces for um one is through hair and nails gallery they're curating a show i think at the mayo clinic in rochester um so that'll be um it won't be there might be some beadwork on it but it's mostly going to be knitting and then um, the gallery up north um, in Bemidji, right? Oh, it. Um, but working on a show for that too. Um, but I do have a couple larger pieces um, that I want to make that I haven't decided whether or not I, I, I feel like I'm just going to make them for myself, but I might share some photos. We'll see. Okay, well, great. Well, apparently we have a lot of questions, so let's get into those. Are you ready? Yep. So first question from Jenny O'Malley. If there were no limitations, what kind of work would you dream of doing? Yeah, well, so one of those is a piece that I am hoping to make. Um, but I want to do um, more large scale beadwork pieces, but with tiny, tiny beads. So and then um, also, I'm not going to explain the whole piece, but there are a couple of projects that I have for that. So I'm, I'm hoping to either like hire help or, you know, um, to get those done in the future. And then, um, no limitations, let's see. I, I mean, I just, I don't know if I have any something specific, but I am just really excited to start exploring with this industrial knitting machine and seeing what it can do um, in terms of fine art too. Great. Do, 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 do. Hannah asks, there's such a connection to the human body in your fine artwork. Do you think that influenced your journey into fashion? Uh, probably. I don't know if I've ever thought about it before. Um, Yes, I would say yes. And then also just thinking about um, func uh, functionality and like, you know, um, and how it makes you feel. I guess I'm all about like emotions and processing things. So it's like, yeah, make, how it makes you feel good. Wonderful. Do Megan asks, what role do you think the artist plays in society and how, how has art changed over time? Yeah, maybe. Um, well, I feel like art is really important in terms of processing and communication. I feel like um, a lot of 
like you can look at a piece of art and feel like it makes you feel things um it's yeah it's just another language and i think it's really important to um, not assume how everybody learns um and i think that's something i learned a lot at waldorf um and then also it captures people's stories personal stories what people are thinking about currently about the times and all that stuff um and i feel like my art it, it's mostly changed through the different mediums i feel like for my fine art practice it's it's always been kind of like a therapy for me so i you know a lot of it is very personal um in terms of its concepts but that doesn't mean that i'm not open to changing that's just what it is where i'm at right now yep cool okay, next oh jenny kryptonite um jenny asks what skills have you developed orchestrating group community projects and she's remembering when you did the quilt when you did the room and mask when you're doing the umbrellas yep um i mean just in terms of managing people <laughs> you know like it's i feel like as an who does like art for yourself it's really hard to like give off things for other people to do um but so it's like handing tasks off um and then also just um asking for help um and really mobilizing folks i communication during these projects i know sometimes i'm really bad at answering my emails but i feel like in these instances you know it's, it's really about quickness and time like we have to be quick do things on time um and then um yeah i i guess and then also having an ear to the ground to like know what people need um and listening to that need and then um figuring out a way to respond to that with whatever skills you have. Wonderful. Yeah. Ned's thinking. Um, Megan asks, um, kids are often dismissed in conversations around identity. Have you had any experiences talking about and sharing art around identity with kids? Um. I mean, just through the teen photography project, mostly, I feel like I've worked, I don't know if I've had like direct conversations with younger kids. I, I mean, I have, I feel like a lot of the groups I've been with are, have always just kind of been in community, like in the native community. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, I did have, a conversation with a third grader the other day who I was bringing home from school on the day of the verdict and he was talking about the importance of learning culture and tradition and how it makes you stronger um, and his mom or his family is also part native so um, to hear him say, say that I was just like whoa <laughs> you're thinking about these things already um, but I think I know some kids have also gone through my exhibits and talked to, I think it's more like a, a response to the work and reflecting on it, but I haven't been a direct participant. In well, way. how do the twins, when you ask the twins, for example, yeah. about being part of that work, mm -hmm. what did they have to say about, you know, cause it is identity. They are a part of that piece. So right. did they have anything to say or did they just smile and yeah. go with it? more shy so they were more quiet but yeah I, yeah they didn't say much they said nothing they put their headphones on and they watched hunt for the wilder people and they were like okay Maggie well it was it was I mean it was an uncomfortable position to be in and they they knew that so it was like creating that com space of comfortability for them um but yeah I Okay. Um, what do you think about the balance of art versus manufacturing? Is there a line? Is it about it intention? So how do you keep that balance or is there a balance? Does it shift? How do you work through that? Um, balance of art versus manufacturing. Um, I I'm trying to think, I mean, 
what I think you're asking. So, I mean, I, I do, I usually block out my time. Um, so during the holidays, I like really focus on knitting or um, art is something I don't, um, I probably push myself more on the knitting, but in terms of creating art, it's a much slower process for me. So I don't necessarily produce a lot of work. Um, and then, yeah, or is, is that, I don't know if I'm answering the question right. Well, I think it's just, I think you talked about it a little bit earlier. It's like you, and I've talked about it with you before about how I spend th these months focusing on my knitwear mm -hmm. and then I, give myself some time to work on stuff for galleries or for shows and stuff like that. Yeah. Um. I, so is that what you do? Yeah. I mean, I do. I, I like, I really value residencies in terms of just like getting away and giving myself the time and space to actually think and process. I don't make a lot of work at residencies, but I do a lot of notes and sketching and stuff like that. Um, yeah. And I, for producing stuff, it's, I usually try and do made to order. So I'm, I don't have a lot of like stock or inventory on hand. So it's, um, yeah. So I got, I got a, I don't know. It's, it's a hard balance. I don't know if I have like the best question because I feel like I'm still figuring it out or the best answer. Um, I have a question. Um, is there any artists Oh, sorry. I uh, and we'll get to Megan's. Um, is there any artists that you want to collaborate with in the future that you just look at or have been following, um, are a huge fan of? Yeah, um, they're the woman who runs Indigo Arrows in Canada. I would love to collaborate with her. Um, I have another friend who I've shown with through the American Craft Council. Um, shows that does indigo dyeing and I think it'd be really sweet to do a series of knit pieces that um, were then dyed um, by her um yeah that's the only two so far off the top of my head but I'm, I'm always open to collaborating I think it's that's when you have the most fun are there any mediums that you want to explore more of um Ojibwe finger weaving. I really want to learn more about that. And then, um, okay. Yeah. So this kind of goes with my thing of who are you watching on social media these days and do they inspire you or do they not inspire you? Like, <laughs> I don't know if my social media is as inspiring, but others might be. Yeah. I mean, the woman who does indigo arrows, I feel like, like, I've been following a lot of photojournalists lately, uh, which there's, um, and then a lot of work coming out of, um, shoot, I think it's the Swedish Institute of Textiles. Like their student work is just like really incredible in terms of like structure and material. And um, I can't remember anyone off the top of my head, but yeah. And then, Cool. Um, Taylor asks, how does being a businesswoman inform your identity and practice? Ooh, that's a good question, good Taylor. Question. Uh, thank you, Taylor. Put me on the spot. Um, I inform my identity and practice. I mean, it's, it's a really hard question. Um, I mean, I feel like the more, I just feel like I function differently than a lot of other business owners um, and like having the flexibility in my business um, and being able to like respond to community is something really important to me. Um, I know that my weakness is probably more on the business side a, like skill set for businesses, but I'm, I, you know what I'm trying to say. Um, but I feel like as I learn, uh, you know, like I, it's something I really want to get down, like my systems, learning systems, I'm creating, like I have a good mentorship group um, that I can call on for help and support. And so it's like building that confidence, I think, 
um, that I'm currently working on. And um, yeah, I guess it's more about like community and communication, I guess, than like systems. I don't know. That's yeah. great. <laughs> no, good. Good job. That was a good answer. It's hard to answer that. And you did a good job. Is there anything else you want to share with everybody who's watching? Any shout outs? Just thank you all for coming. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, thank you, Maggie, for uh, spending time with us and answering questions from community. I think it was a great thing to do. And I'm so happy you did it because I was like, hey, May, are you busy? <laughs> and you're like, yes. <laughs> but then we, we worked it out. So thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for being with us today. And uh, another team miigwech to Rosemary and David Good Family Foundation for their support of these programs. We value our, your opinion. So please follow the link in chat to complete a short, short three minute survey, please. Your input helps us grow these programs. Um, join us next month in May, on May 20th, for a conversation with author Denise Lajmadir and illustrator Dr. Angela Erdrich as they share their new children's picture book, Josie Dances. Chimigwitch again, and I hope everybody has a beautiful day.